Aloha, welcome to Family Affairs, coming to you live from the Think Tech Hawaii studios. I am your host, Lisa Kimura, here to discuss the issues, policies, and initiatives that affect families in Hawaii and what we can do to develop healthier, safer communities. With me today, Erica Yamauchi from Moms Demand Action and Michelle Raka, community advocate, here to talk about the impact of gun laws, how to keep safe during the epidemic of gun violence in our country, and how various coalitions like Moms Demand Action are working to address the issues and impact. Welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So as a mom myself, I know you both are moms too, this is the kind of issue that keeps me up at night. These are the kinds of stories that are happening throughout the country on an almost daily mm -hmm. basis now. Talk to me a little bit about what the situation is with Americans in general and gun violence. Sure. So, well, with Americans in general and, and gun violence, I mean, I was, you're no stranger to the news, and it seems like every day we hear something um, horrific has happened in a, in a public place. It seems like nowhere is safe. Uh, just talking to my friends, you know, who are constantly commenting that they're afraid to go to concerts and large gatherings anymore. Um, I noticed for myself, um, I just had a baby in September, and immediately afterwards just being really heightened awareness of, of what's going on around me and, and always thinking about that. And I think it's just a, it's a new epidemic um, that we will think about every day, and especially as moms hearing about the violence that our kids face in schools um, is really something that we cannot just sit back and, and allow to happen. And so really thankful for community advocates like Erica who are really um, advocating for smart policies um, and to address um, gun laws and, and make sensible um, agreements, community agreements, um, enforced through policy to, to help us all get a little more rest at night. Yeah. 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 And we've got some stats we'll, we'll put up on the screen too, showing your increased likelihood of, of dying from gun violence in this country. But specifically for Hawaii, we tend to, I think, be a little more insulated. We feel like we have stronger laws. Is that true? Where do we have room to grow? What's the situation like for us here? Um, well, I can just speak on, um, yeah, on mom's demand and what we've been working on over the past couple of years because I think, you know, again, with mass shootings um, on the rise um, already this year, we've had you know, more than 100 mass shootings. Um, and just last week we had um, the one in Virginia Beach. And so it seems like, yeah, just we can't keep up, you know, with the news um, about mass shootings in our country. In Hawaii, we... Um, aren't actually stranger to mass shootings. Um, we haven't had one um, in some time, but um, I think people remember in the late 90s, there was uh, um, kind of similar to Virginia Beach, the Xerox um, Corporation mass shooting, um, where kind of similar disgruntled employee um, situation happened. And um, I think around 10 people were um, killed. So um, it has happened in Hawaii. Um, fortunately, it can happen anywhere. Um, so right. our, our laws are, um, I would say, tougher than other, um, uh, other states. However, we still have you know, a lot of work to do. And I think the common misperception is that um, we have strong gun laws, so we don't need to do more. And actually, um, I think some people just assume some common sense gun laws are already in place. But for example, um, this year we were able to pass the red flag um, bill. Um, that's what it's kind of commonly called. But um, it essentially allows um, family members, friends to alert police and um, law enforcement when there is a concern about somebody's behavior that owns, who owns a gun. Um, and um, yeah, allows the court to, um, allows a person to go before a judge and kind of um, make the case for them having the gun or not in that mindset. Um, and so, again, people, I think, assume, oh, that's already true, right? If somebody is a danger to themselves or others, they, don't, they can't have a gun. And actually, that you know, hasn't been true. Right. Um, so um, those kind of red flag laws are um, actually being passed around the country. Um, I think we were um, the 14th state or something to pass that kind of um, yeah, red flag bill or sometimes called a protective order. Um, and those are, again, just in cases of extreme risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Michelle, I know you've had a long history in advocacy in this area and with domestic violence. So talk mm -hmm. to me a little bit about what the issues are when it comes to restraining orders or situations of domestic violence and guns. Sure. Well, um, 
You know, living with a domestic violence perpetrator who is also a gun owner significantly increases the chances of lethality in that domestic violence scenario. And so um, really enforcing policy that's already in place is an issue. And ensuring that the laws that we have in place that deny domestic violence abusers access to guns needs to be upheld each and every time. Um, if you live with a domestic violence abuser who has a gun, you are 16 times more likely to be killed by that gun. 16 times. 16 times wow. more likely. In the United States, um, 50 women each month are killed by a perpetrator that has a gun. And on any given day in the United States, 4.5 million American women have been threatened by by a gun. Wow. So this is um, this is definitely a lethal issue um, that is compounded by the issues of domestic violence um, and already living with somebody who's incredibly dangerous. Um, so, and, and I think uh, mm -hmm. one thing to also that I um, read this morning is there's no federal law that um, prevents domestic abusers from gun. Mm -hmm. So again, it has it's up to the states and every community to on those issues. Right. So in Hawaii, if somebody were to um, access a restraining order, which not all survivors of domestic violence access a restraining order, and not all of them should. Um, a person who is experiencing domestic violence is the expert on what's going to access them the most safety, and, and it's not in all cases that a TRO is that path. Um, for those who do seek a restraining order, um, when that restraining order is served, the officers should be taking away any guns, asking for any guns and removing them. That makes total sense. <laughs> yes, makes absolute sense. Um, we, we know anecdotally that doesn't always happen. Um, we know that uh, domestic violence abusers, when served a TRO, can be quite evasive about their gun ownership and deny that they have a gun or say that it's already been surrendered when it has not. And the issue is essentially dropped. Um, and that person continues to live with a gun. We've heard countless stories over the years where he's sitting in a chair while this um, restraining order is being served, and there's one right under the cushion. Wow. Or they come and remove nine or ten weapons, but he has three or four more stashed, and so they're still they're still present. The other thing that not everyone knows about uh, this intersection with restraining orders or domestic violence and gun ownership is that when an officer arrives um, to, a domestic, to respond to a domestic violence um, incident, in that moment, they are able to seize guns if they believe mm -hmm. with any reason that a gun was used to threaten this person or used in the incident to harm them in any way. So they have the authority um, by state statute to go ahead and take away guns at that time. So um, I really want to get that message out there to survivors that it's not just the intersection of a restraining order being served, which can happen and often doesn't happen for about 9 to 15 days after you've presented your case to a judge. Um, but in that moment, that very night, as is often the case, or day, um, so clarify that a little bit. So if you're in a situation in mm -hmm. which you're fearing for your life, you know there's guns in the home, mm -hmm. and you do not have to wait until the TRO is served? That's right. As long as the officer believes with reason that that, that gun is threatening or was used to threaten in that incident. So as long as the survivor can um, you know, ha clearly explain to the officer, there's a gun here, it's threatening my life. Um, we've had a very serious domestic violence incident. I am not safe in this home. If that gun is in this home, they can take it. And when are the, I would you know, ask, least safe times or the most dangerous times for people when they're in domestic violence situations? The most dangerous time is leaving. Um, in fact, you know, we've, We've heard how many times we've maybe even thought it ourselves because until we know, we don't know. But that's that adage, why would she stay? Why don't you just leave? And in all actuality, leaving is one of the most dangerous things you can do in a domestic violence situation. Um, in fact, 75% of all domestic violence homicide victims are murdered the day they leave wow. or within the first six months. Um, and when... So it really is accessing a community network of safety, accessing the shelters, ad accessing advocacy, using the arm of the criminal justice system if that is going to support or help you 
um, and, and finding, finding your unique path, path to safety because it is a very dangerous time. And I don't say that to encourage people to stay, mm -hmm. but I say that to encourage people to plan for safety, to leave, because it can be very dangerous. And one of the first things an advocate does when they meet with a, a survivor or someone who's actively being victimized um, is a lethality assessment. And one of the primary questions on that lethality assessment is, does your abuser have a gun? Is there guns in the house or do they have access to guns? Because sometimes the case is, no, my abuser does not have a gun, but his best friend does. Mm. And it's easy to get to one. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that he will. Mm -hmm. So that's a key piece of information when we're assessing the lethality um, likelihood for someone who's, who's uh, in a domestic violence situation. And so say, you know, someone wants to seek help, wants to get out of a relationship and, and be safe, or say that you may have your suspicions about someone. How, mm -hmm. first of all, would you ask or approach that subject? And secondly, where do people find help? Sure. So the thing about asking, for, asking somebody is knowing that um, it needs to be a revolving door conversation because somebody may, um, they may tell you, yes, confirm I'm, <clears throat> I'm in a domestic violence relationship but not ready to do anything about it. And they need you to be unwavering without judgment, that you are there for them every step of the way and that you understand that leaving is a process, it's a journey. Um, and just because someone told you that they're going through it does not mean tomorrow it can suddenly change. So um, but I, I would encourage people to ask. I would encourage people to um, make talking about the, um, our intimate relationships and the fear of violence that we experience in this community more open because that helps open doors to, um, to, to navigating safety and to getting the help that you need. So the more we can normalize the conversation and not say, oh, I just suspect this of only you, but I'm asking all of my friends. I'm asking mm -hmm. my sisters. I'm asking my neighbors. I'm talking to people in my church. I'm talking about it. Um, and what would be a way to talk about it? How do you bring that up? Because obviously it'd be very sensitive, and for some people they may be very fearful to release that information. What would be an appropriate way to ask? You could even say something like, I've recently learned that over 25% of women have experienced domestic violence or are experiencing it um, right now, and I'm making it a practice to ask everyone I know if there's some way I can help them or mm -hmm. to let them know that I'm here for you if something ever should happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, normalizing it and saying, I've recently learned or, um, you know, I, I understand that this is an issue that affects uh, every one of us know somebody who's currently being abused. Um, whether we, whether know, we it know it or not. Or not. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so letting your community know, I know that mm -hmm. and I'm doing my best to uncover and to let people know that um, as a member of this community, I'm here. I'm here for you. Excellent. Where do you refer people to if they're in a domestic violence situation? Um, well, first of all, shelter, if they need immediate help um, to access shelter. One of, the, um, one of the resources we have that's easy to access quickly is the Hawaii State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And you can access their website. It's just their acronym, www.hscadv.org. They have a membership tab, and if you click on that membership tab on their website, it lists all of the domestic violence services that are available statewide. So it gives the number, the 24-hour number to shelter hotline, um, as well as, you know, if you need legal advocacy, if you need a restraining order, if you're looking for support groups. And, it, and even if you are someone who is abusive to your partner, if you need um, help and education and counseling to, to move on. So all of those resources are are available at the coalition and there are many domestic violence programs in the state that again range from shelter services to legal advocacy helping people get a restraining order a divorce uh, navigate custody excellent a yeah. lot of issues mm -hmm. we're going to take a quick break okay. we're going to explore this a little bit more when we come back we're going to talk about the be smart program which is one of the programs to help eliminate guns and gun violence um, we'll be right back Aloha, I'm Gwen Harris, the host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of the supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Hey, hey. 
Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Welcome back to Family Affairs at Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Lisa Kimura, your host. We're talking today with Michelle Rocca and, Yarka, and Erica Yamauchi about firearm violence and the laws that we have in Hawaii. Um, when we left off, we were talking a little bit about the relationship between domestic violence and guns. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that, and specifically with some of the mass shootings that we've seen, more so at the national level, what kind of intersection is there with domestic violence? Well, almost always um, in mass shootings, um, the perpetrator has started um, with some kind of domestic violence. Um, so we've seen that um, time and time again with um, Sandy Hook, for example, before he went to the elementary school. He actually you know, murdered his mom um, at their home. So, um, yeah, and I think that, you know, is a very common um, storyline we, that we've seen with mass shootings. Um, so there's a huge direct link. Sure. And not even in our most recent mass shootings, I mean, which is almost always the case, but even older cases where um, that incident that took place, I believe in Austin at the university where in the, t in the tower there was a, mm -hmm. a sniper shooting situation on campus, and he had... Um, just murdered, I believe, both his girlfriend and his mother mm -hmm. leading up to that incident. So it's woven in um, deeply, and it has been since pretty much the onset of this phenomenon of mass, of mass shooting. Um, the sniper in Washington, D.C., um, back when in the early 90s when I was a kid, same thing. At the time, the media was not discussing this link, that this, um, that this shooter was a, a lethal domestic violence perpetrator. His partner did survive and has gone on to educate the community on a national level about this intersection and tries to draw more attention to it. But it's part of media training that we really need to uh, promote and, and educate more that this is deeply linked and that the two go hand in hand. How much of it has to do with, say, toxic masculinity? How much of that is kind of woven in there? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, yeah, I think it has to do with, um, yeah, aggressive behavior in general. Um, yeah, toxic masculinity, um, teaching um, boys and, and young men that um, that's kind of the only path to being a man. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the programs in Moms and Man Action, too, um, like the Be Smart program, um, are all about modeling. We're not, again, anti-gun. It's just modeling responsible behavior around guns. Um, and so... Um, that's definitely part of it too. Starts at um, that young age of being fathers or uncles or um, parents' friends um, using guns in maybe aggressive ways. Um. And I I don't have as much knowledge on the mentality of mass of mass shooters, but to speak to the domestic violence aspect piece. It's about having power and control. It's about seeing your family members as your property of having ownership and using violence to gain their submission. Um, and often, you know, domestic violence doesn't start with gun violence on a first date. It's a process. It's a process of escalation. It's a process of um, using tactics to gain submission and then leveling up those tactics when, those no, when they no longer work. So we do see an increase in the relationship between the survivors and dependents and the, the force that's used to, to um, try to get the partner to submit or family members mm -hmm. to submit. Um, and I think that, that this link to mass shootings, and I, you know, I don't know, with, can't say with certainty, but that it's another escalated step beyond mm -hmm. um, taking control of the family through lethal actions of the family, but now into community. Mm -hmm. Is there any type of, say, profile of what a domestic abuser looks like? 
I always say, "Gosh, that would be so nice <laughs> because if they just all wore the same hat <laughs> or had the same tattoo, we could just train everybody around avoiding that." But unfortunately, um, there is no um, there is no common profile. There, the things that they have um, in common aren't necessarily in personality, but rather in characteristics. So, for example, um, having the concept of very rigid gender roles. Um, I'm the breadwinner. I'm the king of this castle. It's my rules, or or you will be punished. Sort of mentality. Um, it, it's about being very controlling, possessive. Another thing that's common and um, almost always is their own isolation and codependency. A lot of people think it's the victim in a domestic violence situation who is the codependent personality, but really it's the opposite. It's the abuser who is codependent on the person he is in an intimate relationship with for a sense of power mm -hmm. and for a sense of having control in one's life. So very dependent on that person to have those uh, emotional needs met and therefore extremely threatened when that person takes their independence back or tries to achieve more independence, which is why we see um, lethality increase with, with leaving and especially if there's a gun involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the link between violence during pregnancy for victims? There, it, it's huge. Um, unfortunately, in domestic violence relationships, um, pregnancy is um, another indicator of lethality, and it can be, it's absolutely one of the most dangerous times um, in a violent, intimate relationship. Another factor that happens with, with pregnancy is that where um, sites of injury when the female is not pregnant tend to be the face, the neck, and the arms or the head, um, during pregnancy it's hyper concentrated to the abdomen, so serious um, consequences for, for the, it, the developing fetus as well. Um, but yes, yeah, an extremely dangerous time, it's extremely lethal time, um, and so we really want to talk to and reach out to, to families who are experiencing pregnancy about their safety and to ensure that they know where resources are to help them. Mm -hmm. Also done a lot of advocacy over the years to engage OBGYNs um, and those who care for pregnant women medically along the way on how to screen appropriately and how to talk about violence in the home. And is there a link between the, say, severity of violence or the frequency of violence and the presence of guns? Yes, I would say absolutely. And so the Be Smart program, Erica, that Moms Demand Action is working on, mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit more about that and what, yeah. it's, what, what are the goals, how does it work? Yeah, so it was developed as a framework to help um, families kind of think about um, yeah, because again, we see this, you know, I think a lot in the media too, um, little kids um, unintentionally shooting themselves mm -hmm. or um, their siblings or a friend. Um, and actually that happens about 260 times a year. Wow. Um, and so we, um, at Moms Demand Action, created this Be Smart framework to kind of inform the public about what we can all do to help prevent these type of deaths and injuries um, in children. And so. Um, there's uh, yeah, an acronym, SMART, that helps us remember it. So S um, stands for secure all guns in homes and vehicles. Um, M stands for modeling, again, modeling that responsible behavior around guns. Um, A is for ask, um, and that means asking when your child is sleeping over at a friend's house or just having a play date. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like this one. Um, because again, it just encourages people to talk about guns more openly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's gonna be so crucial in creating a gun safety culture, I think, in um, the US. And so, yeah, when, if, you're, if your child is going over to a friend's house asking, um, do you all have firearms in the home? Are they secured? Um, and so right. children can't gain access to them. So that's A, and then, um, so SMART, and then R is um, um, recognizing the role that guns also play in suicides. So um, I don't think a lot of people know this as well, but more than 600 um, kids, uh, children, teenagers die by suicide every year in the U.S. Um, using guns that wow. they have in the home um, that were wow. unsecured. And then um, T is tell others about the Be Smart um, program and again try to make that culture change mm -hmm. about talking about guns openly in the community. 
I mean, I can imagine it would be an uncomfortable situation or conversation potentially to have, say, with mm -hmm. a playmate of your friend. How, I mean, have you had experience with that kind of conversation yet? And how would that go? I have, actually. Um, and so I, um, I did actually over text message. So that's sometimes easier, right, to have that conversation. Um, and my daughters are still pretty young, but um, I did try to make it a point with my older daughter when um, she was at a play date to ask, um, yeah, like, and I, I encourage um, parents to think about it. Just like if you would say, um, yeah, May has a egg allergy, saying, or she just ate, and FYI, um, you know, we don't have guns in our home if you're ever coming over, but I wanted to ask if you all have mm -hmm. guns and are they secured? Mm -hmm. um, so just making it part of that kind of logistical conversation mm -hmm. that I think we all as moms have um, about allergies mm -hmm. and if we have a dog or a cat, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So thinking about legislation a little bit, has there been anything in Hawaii that, that Moms Demand Action has been working on? Is there something that you're working towards? What would be kind of the ideal picture? Well, I just, yeah, speak on behalf of um, the Moms um, chapter in Hawaii has um, gotten a lot of uh, momentum in the last couple of years around these, yeah, um, what we call common sense um, gun bills. And so this year, like I mentioned, the red flag um, bill was passed and um, we're really happy that that was um and it's going to be signed by um, governor Ige, um hopefully soon right. but um yeah so similar um legislation um i think pretty much every um law that we've worked on the past um two or three years has been related in some way to um kind of reducing these domestic violence um incidents too mm -hmm. um and so those are kind of you know the bills that we're focused on is just really common sense mm -hmm. um gun safety legislation um mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I want to encourage everybody you know, that's listening, if they're interested, to um, get involved. Actually, National um, Gun Violence Awareness Day is this weekend, um, oh, wow. June 7th, um, what we call Wear Orange. So encouraging people to wear orange. There's um, an event on Oahu and on Maui. Um, and so you can go to wearorange.org um, um, to kind of learn more about the events happening. Excellent. All right. Well, definitely make sure everybody checks out the Wear Orange event coming up this weekend. Um, with that, thank you so much for being here today. And thanks for talking about this really important issue. Um, thank you for tuning in. This is Family Affairs on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Lisa Kimura, and we'll see you next time.